Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and we did another Ask Me Questions in a Lantern. I do want to start by saying you're going to see an individual video for each question, and I may not be able to answer all of them, but don't take it personally, you just have to do what I can do. So this first one, uh, the question is, you are often in audio shows where these 100K plus stereo systems are displayed with six foot tall towers, expensive cabinetry, cabling, and very expensive amplifiers. Is it likely that a modest pair of well-measuring towers under 10K price with a sub or two paired with, uh, with a suitable but similarly priced stereo amplifier will outperform the former? I think that that's actually a little bit of a loaded question, to be honest with you. And my answer is, there's, it's starting with the assumption that when I go to audio shows, and, I, and you know, 100K is actually nothing. I've sat in rooms with million dollar systems. My own system is over $100,000. So I've sat in rooms with uh, multi-million dollars uh, worth of equipment in them and listened to them. The problem is that that's assuming that money equates to quality. And then the other part of this that's a little bit mixed up is it's saying, well, like modest size versus these gigantic towers. And gigantic towers do tend to cost more money. So I understand what the real question is, and I kind of want to get away from the money side of it and get away from the size side of it, because that's the wrong way to look at it. So first off, there becomes a limit, a lower limit, at which you will lose sound quality as a result of making performance compromises that come from trying to keep the price down. So there was a, a, a price point here of what, under $10,000 for speakers. I don't think $10,000 is like the point of diminishing returns or the point where things don't get better. The other part of this is size. Well, it's not really about size. It's actually about bandwidth and dynamic range within that bandwidth. And size doesn't necessarily equate to those things. I could show you a speaker that's maybe like this big that could do 120 dB at uh, one meter or more. The bandwidth that it could do that over might be limited to 200 hertz or so on up to 20 kilohertz, but such a thing exists and we use them in home theaters all the time in, in certain scenarios. Uh, would it sound good? I mean, they can uh, within that bandwidth and they would need subwoofers uh, and at that point probably mid-bass modules of some kind to really get the full bandwidth, but you could put together something probably decent from that. So let's really go back to what I think the real question is, which is, do these really esoteric high-end systems that I see at shows that I end up sometimes having for review in my own system or that I uh, hear at client homes, uh, do they really outperform to the point that they're, let's say, worth the money, something that could be achieved for a lot less money? I think that's what's being asked. And the answer is, of course, you could achieve something of very similar performance for less money. So. What is that number? Well, I've mentioned this before, in my opinion, having heard a lot of different speakers over the years, I fell into the Perlison speakers because I really liked what they were about and I liked their sound. The S7T LEs are 30 grand. They remain the best sounding speaker I've ever heard in my life. So I'd be hard pressed to say with that being true that $10,000 a pair, let me just make sure it even says that, uh, just says 10,000. I'm assuming that's a pair, um, would be able to come close enough to those to be considered that good. There are a lot of speakers on the market that measure decent and don't cost a lot of money, but they make compromises. So when we get into the under $10,000 stuff, there's, there's two main areas where we start to see big compromises. The first one is the bandwidth becomes more limited for a given output, and the second one is output. Many of those speakers simply can't play loud enough to hit realistic levels. And we typically talk about that in cinema in terms of reference levels, but the reality is music has a sort of realistic level too. If all you care about is the spectral balance of the speaker, the timbre, there are speakers that are very inexpensive that have a near perfect timbre to them. In fact, if you go to companies like, uh, let's see, Neumann or Genelec, those are two companies whose speakers are uh, you could definitely do them for under 10 grand and they measure and they actually have amplifiers built in so you can skip the amplifier part they measure extremely well so they have a very very linear directivity index 
which means that their on and off axis response is very consistent. They have a very flat listening response, and it doesn't really change a lot as you get off axis. It just falls off, basically. It gets quieter. And they even have pretty good bandwidth. They cannot play loud. You could not use them in a home cinema. You'd have to get into the bigger ones, and you'd still have to high pass those, and they still are limited. When you get into the really large home cinemas, really large, I don't mean like auditorium sized, even some of those bigger speakers in this room, which is a modest sized theater, would be up near their limit. So once you start to get into rooms bigger than mine, like Gene Della Sala, for instance, his, a lot of those speakers are getting past their limit. They would not meet, for instance, CDA RP22 requirements uh, for SPL. And as a result, you could not produce a level three or four home theater with those speakers in a room the size of, again, like Gene's. Uh, on the other hand, in a room like mine, you probably could get level three with some of the biggest of those, but the small ones for sure not. In fact, Genelec has one, they're like really tiny. I remember I, I saw pictures of them and I'm like, oh, they're so cool. And then I didn't realize how small they were and I saw them in real life and I'm like, oh wow, they're only like this big, measure extremely well, no output. I mean, they just are great for a desktop, but you cannot use those for a home theater. So. That, so so the, I guess the, the answer to that question is you, you run into compromises that become quite serious. And to me, those compromises are not to be ignored. I think some people really want to be able to justify they can't afford these $30,000 speakers. They got to be able to justify that what they bought is every bit as good or better than what people got when they spent more. And the, and the reality is as soon as you start to get to a point of using the same concepts of it needs to be a well-engineered product that measures well, has a good linear directivity index, etc., you can keep spending more and keep getting more. And sure, at some point, you'll probably have hit a limit where you've hit as much close to perfection as you possibly can. And after that, it gets into jewelry. The Perlison that I'm mentioning has jewelry to it. There are things that were done to that that you could get rid of and get the cost down some, but they didn't, and so you can't buy that speaker in a different way. Uh, so again, though, I think the biggest limitations we tend to see when we come down in price is dynamic range and bandwidth. Having said that, there are some speakers that are on the lower price range that do have decent output, and they actually do have decent bandwidth, but then they do start to give up on timbre. Um, and there are, and, and as you get lower in price, Kef's a good example of this, where their higher end stuff measures extremely well, sounds very good. As you start to get down in price, the product doesn't measure quite as well. It's still good. It's one of the better products in the market, but they do get worse. Ravel's another one. The upper end stuff measures really well, sounds pretty decent as you get down in price. It doesn't measure as well, doesn't sound as good. And, you know, it's because they're making compromises. Um, with, again, like picking on Genelec, with their stuff, it doesn't really, their, their cheapest speaker and their most expensive speaker measure about the same. The difference is output and bandwidth. And really, it's more output than anything else. So, because some of the little ones actually have bass down into like the upper 20, low 30 hertz range. They just have zero output there. Like they just can't put out very much. It's, it's not a usable amount of, of output there. So uh, in the in the like in our world, when you get into certain brands uh, that are offering high value speakers, there still are compromises there, and those don't exist as much at the higher price point. I understand there's going to be a desire to like say, well, can you hear those differences? I mean, I, I'm not going to answer that for you. You're going to have to kind of figure that out for yourself. There are measurable differences. Research suggests that those differences are audible under the right conditions. Whether you have those conditions and you can hear the difference, I don't know. That's really up to you to decide for yourself. It doesn't mean that the systems that are put together for modest money are bad or that they're not able to produce very high performance and sound really great or be enjoyable. I mean, remember, this is a hobby. This is all about enjoyment. The fact that there's a science and that there's physics behind it is totally unrelated to the fact that at the end of the day, you, the people watching this video, are buying this stuff to enjoy it. I hope you're not buying it for the physics. That's a silly reason to get into this. You should be listening to music and enjoying it. If that system brings you joy, it's done its job. And it doesn't really matter that you could spend three times as much and get a small incremental improvement. But we also can't take away from the fact that you can spend three times as much and in fact get an improvement. You know, I, I want to be clear that I don't really like the viewpoint that there's some amount of money where anything above that is just a waste of money and it's just rich people being silly. I just, in my experience, that hasn't been true. Uh, in fact, I still don't have a number that I would tell you this is the number which I've never heard something better than. It's perfect and nothing can be better. Even the best sounding speakers I've ever heard could be bettered. And it would cost a lot more money to do that. And so nobody's bothered. And I've never heard an experimental speaker, for instance, where somebody just was like, 
let's throw caution to the wind, make the speaker perfect, who cares what it costs? So I don't know what a perfect speaker sounds like, but I know when I look at the measurements of the best speakers I've heard, there are imperfections, they could be bettered, but it's really debatable whether it would be worth it given what it would do to the cost of the product. And I think that that also is a part of the question being asked, which is that even the things that were done to put the product on the market, were they necessary? Can you get the same sound for less? And the answer, I still would say within the range we're talking about is probably no, there are still audible improvements, but I get it. And, I, and again, I do think you can do a modest system that sounds quite good. The best way, in my opinion, to put together a high performance system at a lower budget is to scale it down. So trying to achieve high performance with high output that can be done in a large room, but at a very low budget is not possible. So when your budget is limited, the best thing you can do is try to put your system in a smaller space, make it more personal, and then you can use better sounding equipment that doesn't cost as much because it doesn't need to have as much output. And then of course subwoofers are great because subwoofers, you can get extremely high performance subwoofers for not a whole lot of money. And they give you all the low end bandwidth you need. And a lot of them have enough output that that doesn't become a major concern in these smaller systems either. There are, you know, subwoofers you can buy that when added to the other speakers are going to give you everything you need in that range. But I would still argue that the speaker you're using needs to have sufficient output. I make a big deal about output. I have a lot of speakers on the market. In my opinion, at one meter, they don't play loud enough to be useful. So listening back at two or three meters, which is what a small room would be like, they're not going to be adequate either. So in terms of what the question was asked, I think Really, yeah, I don't know that $10,000 is going to be it to equal the best systems I've heard. I think that you could put together a $100,000 system that would dramatically better that $15,000, $20,000 system that you made with the $10,000 speakers. Whether that's worth it to you depends on whether you have the money to spend on that or not, right? I mean, up, up until recently, when I got into the industry enough that I could afford to buy this stuff or had access to this stuff, I didn't own systems like that. I didn't own $30,000 speakers. In fact, the last good pair of speakers I owned, I built myself because I couldn't afford to do better. They were from Gettys, and I believe built retail price on that would have been $7,000 a piece. I think they're very good. They're a compromised speaker. Their frequency response could be dramatically improved with DSP, for instance. Uh, they had some issues uh, because of the waveguide design in the vertical response, which you know Gettys always argued was not audible, but it was there, and there are ways to fix it, and it could have been bettered. They had very limited bandwidth. They could barely play down to 80 hertz. They started rolling off at about 120 hertz and absolutely needed subwoofers to perform their best. But they did other things so well, like their directivity index was among the best you'd ever see. It was extremely linear. And it made it as, as something that was very, it was like a great palette to work with. Once you have that, you add your subwoofers, you add some DSP, you've got a good system. You know, for amplifiers, uh, you can buy what I would consider to be state-of-the-art amplifiers for dirt cheap anymore. And I understand there's going to be some folks who don't like me using that term dirt cheap in the sense that that's very relative. But at least to me, there was a time when a mediocre Class AB amplifier was still pretty good. But like you'd have to spend a fortune to better it kind of thing. Like most, basically most amplifiers were kind of mediocre. Or you might argue the opposite of most amplifiers were adequate, they were good, and there weren't a lot of differences between them. Um, but there were amplifiers, Boulder's a good example. They make a great amplifier, but they're really expensive. And it was really hard to get the kind of performance you could get out of a Boulder amplifier for a lot less money. And then brands like Hypex and Purify came out. Even Ice Edge, their newest, Ice's new stuff, uh, Ice Power. Uh, it's all good enough now that it betters that other stuff other than maybe in bandwidth. And I don't know that that matters. So now you've got a lot of power. Some of the designs at least have pretty decent current to them, which allows them to double their power as you get into lower impedances. They have a frequency response that no longer varies with uh, the load, which class APs never really did, but class Ds typically always did. And they've got signal to noise ratios that are unheard of. They have distortion levels that are unheard of, and they've now gotten to a point where they're basically, as far as I can tell, straight lines would gain as much, or straight, you know, piece of wire would gain. It, it was, they're as close to perfect as you can expect from an amplifier. 
The only thing beyond this that I, you know, I think we would argue for is more power. There are scenarios where we need more than what those can do, but they're getting more powerful over time. So I think in the amplifier world, you really don't have to spend very much money. And there's these little like cottage shops, these guys that have put together small businesses that you can order directly from who are making amplifiers based on the modules, where all they got to do is put together a nice case, make sure they dress the wires appropriately to not cause any additional noise, use an off-the-shelf power supply with an off-the-shelf module. Some of them are doing custom input stages, some of them are not. And either way, they're all getting really good performance. And they're all good to the point that they better what you used to be able to get 20 years ago at any amount of money. Those are really good amplifiers that you can use in any system. I would argue they're all more than they need to be good enough because there are some amazing sounding speakers that actually use really crummy amplifiers, uh, including the, the Genelec and the Neumanns that I mentioned. If you saw what amplifier modules were in those and what their performance was like, I think you would call those crap. And yet those speakers sound great and they're, they're obviously perfectly adequate for the job. Um, there's DACs now. I mean, I have one in my system that I'm playing around with. I think it's like $200 or it's under $300, I'm pretty sure at least. Uh, it's the, I think it's the SMSL DS6A, something like that. I don't know, it's not very expensive. It's about as good as you can get for measurements. I mean, there are some stuff that's a little bit better, but it, again, it kind of falls into that, like, could you possibly hear the difference? There's no way this thing is producing enough noise and distortion to be audible. There's no other real significant issues. Jitter is extremely low. Like, everything about it is good. I'm having some issues with it that are unrelated to audio performance, but for audio performance, the thing is great. It's so, like we've kind of hit a point now where the front end, uh, the source, the front end, the, the uh, amplifier, they're all... It, it, they're as good as it needs to be to the point that a $10,000 system and a million dollar system are going to be equally good in that regard. Again, other than maybe output power. It's the speakers that are really making the difference. And I do think that there are still substantial differences in speakers across wide price ranges. So I hope this video is helpful. I rambled a little bit, but hopefully that helped you guys kind of understand my take on this. Um, I think I've covered this before uh, in different ways, and I'm going to kind of stick to my point that, that like I said, as a conclusion here, I don't really think that it's fair to say that there's some number where you can equal the performance of a better system, all else being equal. I think that, of course, you could put together a $20,000 system that betters a million-dollar system if the million-dollar system is loaded with expensive crap. And that is actually really common, even at these audio shows. But that isn't to say there aren't systems at these audio shows that cost well north of six figures that significantly better what you can do for a lower number. So I hope this is helpful. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.